Welcome and thanks for joining this online webinar. There will be an opportunity at the end of the webinar to ask questions in the Q&A box, so please take advantage of that. Now, visibility is a key factor on why we are doing what we are doing. And here I'm hoping to shed some light on our findings in the last quarter and having a look at how bad it is out there when it comes to the threat landscape. Now, we developed the Fortinet Threat Landscape Index in mid-2018 to answer a seemingly simple yet deceptively difficult question, are these things getting better or worse out there? It is really about billions of events that we are observing in real-time production environments where we are specifically looking at malware, application exploits and botnets and are looking to see if we can find any trends where we can then transfer this knowledge back to our customers to help them where they can improve on their cybersecurity posture. And this is really what it's all about. Now, we will be looking at the following topics in the agenda for today. We will be looking at our index to see if things are getting better or worse out there based on the rate of change over time. I will then be talking about the threat trends. We will have a quick view on ransomware. And again, no presentation will be complete without touching on an update on cryptocurrency. And then we will have a look at, uh, at our findings on CMS, which is the content management system, and how we are seeing an attacker swarming to take advantage of technologies to accomplish the goal on a global scale. From here, we will move to the adversary tactics and techniques to look a bit deeper into what the adversaries are doing. Now, Fortunate has developed uh, playbooks available where you can do a deep dive into some of these adversaries to see basically what they're actually doing. We will then talking on specific group and share some of our findings and this information is also available in our playbooks. We will then touch base on the components on what is known as living off the land and lateral movements. Now business is changing and that includes the business of the malware distributors. So based on that we will then have a view on the types of community infrastructure that these guys are using. And then we will end the presentation by looking at some key recommendations. But let's start off with the Threat Landscape Index. Now, we wanted to have a view to determine if things are getting better or worse. Now, Fortunate has the largest security device footprint in the industry. And this unique vantage point offers excellent views of the cybersecurity threat landscape from multiple perspectives. Now, if we are saying that things are getting worse, then how much worse is it getting? Or if we are saying that things are getting better, then how much better is this getting? Now, if we look at the overall threat landscape or threat index, we can see that there was a lot more volatility than the quarters before. But the reality when looking at this graph is that at the end of the quarter, this is slightly just over 1% over the quarter before. Now, if you're like me, then you would ask the question on what is it that might be driving this volatility? What's going on here? Now, there is a lot of actors that can play a role here, and that is where swarming comes into play. Whenever there is a vulnerability that can be successfully exploited, adversaries will swarm in and try to capitalize on the specific vulnerability. A great, a great example of this happens to be the ThinkPHP development framework for web applications. And that was exploits that were targeting remote code execution or RCE vulnerability. Taken alone, that may not seem like that unusual. I mean, exploits come and go regularly, right? But for those who monitor such things, this is rather odd on a couple of accounts. Now, one of them is that ThinkPHP hasn't landed that high on any of our lists in recent memory. And secondly, this is typically used mostly in China. But in the last year, December, there was a vulnerability that was announced and a few weeks later, a proof of concept exploit was available. And once that happened, we could see that there was an increase in our radar on this vulnerability. Once a vulnerability has been released and someone has a proof of concept and could successfully exploit that vulnerability, it's a swarm-like type of activity. And if a typical vulnerability was exploited, what they would typically end up doing is the installation of a PHP backdoor and abuse of the system for DDoS attacks, malware distribution, and fueling of botnets. Now, Blue Hero is one such a botnet we observed aggressively leveraging compromised ThinkPHP host for crypto mining schemes. Now, this is just an example of what was driving the volume and volatility. Now, this volatility and new exploits could be all connected, right? Because if one area of the cyber kill chain happens to increase, usually you will have an increase of volume in other ones as well. As an example, you could have an increase in the volume of a vulnerability 
and this vulnerability would then be associated with malware. But then that could also be connected to a botnet for command control communications. And what we can see here is how and why this is so tightly integrated. Now, looking at the threat trending, we can talk on some topics, but most people in the cybersecurity space here are more familiar with ransomware. Now, we have talked about the cybercrime ecosystem before, where it is becoming easier to get hands on these tools and even sometimes have SLAs attached to the services. All they need to do is to understand where to get these tools and resources, and they need a little bit of money. And ransomware as a service oftentimes is the actual payload of choice these days for these types of services. This is one of those things that we've seen been driven the volume of this ransomware over the last few years. And what the 40 card team has seen is that its payload has been integrated with more attacks that is way more targeted hands-on keyboard type of attacks. We saw that last year with the SamSam ransomware. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the SamSam ransomware, this ransomware took down the city of Atlanta for a few days that affected potentially up to 6 million people. And in 2018, Samsung uses other vulnerabilities in remote desktop protocols, Java-based web servers, or FTP servers to gain access to the victim's network, or they use brute force against weak passwords to obtain an initial foothold. The Samsung actors target multiple industries, including some within the critical infrastructure, and we will talk, uh, we will talk about that in the near future as well. Logagoga is one of them, and they were focusing on critical infrastructure that is a lot more targeted attacks. The Furikar team did a lot of analysis on Logagoga, and what was concerning about this one is that there was not a lot of things that were special about it. It was just common malware. It did not have a lot of evasion types of techniques in the samples that was analyzed. Now, while most ransomware tools use some level of, of uh, obfuscation, like trying to make things more difficult to avoid detection, this one didn't. But it could be possible that there was a couple of reasons for this. It is as if they did the reconnaissance and they had a look at the security controls that was in place and probably discovered that the security controls that were in place will not be able to detect this ransomware. It was as if they thought that there was no need to go the extra mile, as if it was just perfectly and fit for purpose. So try to keep this in mind when looking at these different types of malware and specifically on ransomware. We also saw Anatoba, and that's a superior 64-bit ransomware. And the actors behind Anatoba appears to have taken a cue from the operators of last year's prophylic grand crab in demanding ransomware payments in Dash cryptocurrency instead of the usual bitcoins. And one of the things we, that we're seeing on the right side shows global detection of the targeted variants of Lokogoga, Anatoba, and Grand Crab ransomware. And we wanted to have a look to see which countries have the highest volume. Those who follow such things will note that this is not your typical opportunistic threat geographic distribution. The patterns here suggest targets of choice rather than targets of chance. And we will certainly continue to monitor this trend as it develops. Now with that in mind, we are seeing that ransomware is being combined with more targeted, tailored attacks. And this is only going to increase their success rate. So just make sure that you have the ability to detect these types of ransomware in your environment. And make sure also that you have offline backups just in case you need to, store, you need to restore that in your critical data or infrastructure. Cryptocurrency and crypto jacking. There has been many conversations around this, sometimes even more than ransomware. These volumes were a bit higher than ransomware last year. And crypto jacking is really malware that gets in your machine and it's stealing CPU resources. And they use it basically to mine for cryptocurrency. At the end of the day, if you can verify a cryptocurrency transaction, then you are going to get money for that. For you to do that, you would need processing power. And on the updates here, some of the volumes that was driven was because of the signature coin hive. Now, for those who don't know, CoinHive was actually part of a legitimate business with tools available where you could mine cryptocurrency. This was one of the highest volumes, but this dropped off tremendously. What is interesting when looking at this, what was the like we're looking at this like what was the drop off traffic? That was because CoinHive is no longer in business. All of the services in browsers mining scripts it actually stopped working on March the 8th. So we know that CoinHive was using Monero, and Monero's mining algorithm is designed for ordinary computers that was not as CPU resource intensive such as Bitcoin. 
Now, this was another reason why Monero was an attraction for more and a meta team. And with Bitcoin again, that wallet was a public record. This was making a good amount of money, but CoinOff gave a couple of reasons for the decision to close business. First was the decline in value of Monero, whose value has fallen as much as 85% over the past year. Second is the fact that the currency has become much harder to mine. Now, we've also seen that some crypto, uh, crypto jacking and crypto mining malware, it is more than just looking at mining. Now, they sometimes actually open ports on the firewall and then lowering your shield uh, where the advisors can then download more malware. So if you see an alert on your system with crypto jacking, it could be a precursor of more attacks that might be coming in your environment. So please just watch out for that. Swarm attacks. Not only did we see this in PHP, but we also started to see this in content management systems or CMS systems. Now, it could be that if you want to follow the attack trends, you just need to follow the technology trends because the attackers are not that far behind. Now, this is a prime example here where everyone wants to get the content out there and to have it continuously updated. And again, content management systems allows for them to do this more efficiently and effectively. So you might see more and more of these systems on the network. However, these systems have vulnerabilities on them. You might have seen a lot of this in the past around WordPress, but also close to that is Joomla. Joomla announced six vulnerabilities this year. Now we know that there are a lot of developers out there that's using third-party tools as part of their toolbox. Let's attempt to actually increase the attack surface as well. Now, there are also the vulnerabilities on these applications that you have to worry about. And the adversaries took full advantage of this in Q1. There was a huge campaign that focused on Joomla and WordPress sites. And what we were seeing that they were doing was focusing on compromising the system and then use that to redistribute ransomware and phishing pages. The advice here is to make sure that if you're using CMA systems in your environment, please make sure that they are on the patch levels that they're supposed to be on and make sure that all the plugins are also on the relevant batch levels. Now, taking a deep dive on the stats in Australia on the bots, we can see that uh, Android Media is the second highest prevalent bot and Topic was the highest in Australia. Now, Android Media botnet is still pretty prevalent in AU, which indicates that a lot of infected or unpatched devices is still out there trying to phone home. Now, according to Microsoft, the main purpose was to distribute other malware families. Despite being the subject of an international takedown operation, traces of this botnet can still be found on many PCs. So Torbic is spread via another rootkit and scans infected systems for sensitive data such as bank accounts and credit card info. And that was first released in 2005. And again, on the IPS front, we see a lot of SNMP private access alerts. And that was first created in September 2006. Now the impact is information leaks that may assist future attacks. So just be careful if you see that in your environment. And on the AV side of things, the biggest threat that regarding Australia is the OSX Genio browser hijacker. And that is targeting macOS systems that behaves like adware. And that was first released also in February 2014. So next, it is good to see what the Fortinet research team, the FortiGuard team, has been doing when looking at how the adversaries are doing what they are doing. So for you guys that's online, you want to have a look at this. The FortiGuard team has been creating adversary playbooks for a while now in conjunction with the Cyber Threat Alliance. They then started to document this, what the threat actors are doing, and to see basically how we can potentially disrupt some of that malicious activity. Now the 40 card team is doing this by mapping it back to the Mitra attack framework. Now the Mitra attack framework is a comprehensive matrix of tactics and techniques used by threat hunters, red teamers and defenders to better classify attacks and then uh, look at that to improve the organizations or look at the organization's risk. This is a great common language we can all reference to see what the adversaries are doing. The one that we're going to focus on in this example is the silent group threat actor. Now the group went undetected for many years, mainly because of their ability for using legitimate applications and tools already found on the victim's computers. That's in a tactic known as living off the land. But the silence group also created their own tools. One was called silence and that was a framework for infrastructure attacks. They had atmosphere so that was attacks on ATMs also called jackpotting. They had FAS and that was a tool to obtain passwords of uh, the compromised computers. 
and then they had the cleaner and that was just to remove their locks. Now if you look at these tools coupled with the group's lay low tactics, it helped them to go under the radar for much longer than many of its counterparts. Now this group had activity in more than 25 countries and the confirmed damage of the group is about 800,000 US dollars. Not only are we creating a blog with more information on this, but we've also created a playbook and a playbook viewer. And we will share the link with you guys in the notes of the presentation. Now, if you're like me, then you would want to have a look at this playbook and look into the details of how these guys are doing what they are doing. So here we're going to deep dive a little bit deeper into it. If we look at the overall playbook itself and the intrusion set, one can see that it is very, very robust. We have identified five different types of campaigns going back to 2016. We have 436 indicators, 15 vulnerabilities, and 86 attack patterns. Now the main targets here are the banks and the banking infrastructure. And if an adversary is successful, it is most probably because someone clicked on the link or clicked on attachment. And again, in the background, malware would then be downloaded. Now this is very interesting looking at it into the next steps. So there are a couple of different modules that would then be installed on the victim's machine when they're successful. Now there would be the main module and there would also be a proxy module. And the adversary would then use the proxy module to move from network to network inside of the organization. Now the monitoring module that they were using is very powerful. What the monitoring module would do is it will actually take a snapshot of your machine, but so many snapshots that it will look like a streaming video back to them. Now the last module is the ATM module, and this is the jackpot for the guys. The ATM module will look for the ATM process, finds that process, and inject a malicious DLL into the process, which would then give them total control over the ATM machines. This meant that they would then dispense money at will. They would have money mules that will then come and collect the money. One can see here the details of the actual campaign, and one can see the different tactics and corresponding techniques um, in our playbook viewer as well. So they would have the execution for that they can use to execute a script that would then call the PowerShell. And the next layer is persistence. That is what they would then use in the registry or run keys. Now, a lot of adversaries want to spend time on the machine as long as possible. So what they would do is put that malware in the registry run keys. Now there's around 50 different auto start areas in just Windows and there's about 50 places it looks to actually run. So again, to have more information in this and the criticality around this, please have a look at our playbook viewer. So majority of cyber attacks use lateral movement and living of the land. Now, what does this mean? This usually means that adversaries are using tools or software that is already available on the machines. Another example is PowerShell. It is one of the most common ones that the adversaries are using to complete the cyber mission. Now there are other tools such as RunDLL32, Register32, and the adversaries will use this to register the DLLs. And they do this because it is mostly a trusted source, right? Now the reason why we're adding this here is that we are continuously seeing this activity and most likely will continue to see this in the future. Now we as a cyber community are getting better and better on this. But this also means that the adversaries are getting less and less successful. And usually what this means is that necessity is the birth of new inventions. So adversaries will start to focus on something else that will help them with their goals. So a lot of the malware out there today that are being used by the threat actors are open source that is freely available that the good guys use as well. Now some of these tools you can download from GitHub and Metasploit as an example is what the threat actors can use. Now lastly, there was a tool that the good guys introduced uh, by Libicon and it was called Silent Trinity. And that is a post-exploitation tool that is powered by Python, IronPython, and C Sharp. And it interacts with the .NET framework. And to do some of these things you would need to do with PowerShell, but with our PowerShell. Now, it might be very possible at some point that we might be seeing this in the cybercrime ecosystem in the future as well. But you guys have a look at this tool. It is freely available to download and run it in your environment and have a look at the logs and see what it might generate and make sure that you have rules in place to start and test some of this activity in your environment. Now, I would also suggest having a look at some of the other tools that you can get out there to test your security, but have a look at the Mitra framework again. Uh, Magic Unicorn is another one that you can look at and also have a look at uh, Atomic Red Team. And it's also a lot of library for uh, tests that you can use in reference. 
We did some research on the community infrastructure and what we found out was that almost 60% of all the threats share at least one domain. What that basically means is that they share at least one command and control infrastructure. Kind of makes sense. Now, when you do a deep dive in the cybercrime ecosystem, it is aggressive and competitive marketplace. Everyone there is buying for your services. And they're trying to get my service better than your service so that you can basically end up buying the services. So again, it's very competitive. Now, one of the things that they're trying to offer in this community is stability. They want to make sure that if you are buying a service from them, that it will work now, but also in the long term. That is a running business for these guys. And one of the things that adversaries are trying to do is to make, to make that they can build an infrastructure for them that is reliable and stable. And a lot of this infrastructure are located in bulletproof hosting centers. And again, the adversaries will then share this infrastructure. Now, what we have seen is they're not sharing everything across the kill chain, only certain stages that was part of the infrastructure would they actually be shared. Now, threat actors may actually be using this community infrastructure to avoid attribution. It seems like they might be using this to blend in with a cybercrime ecosystem to be able to avoid being able to tie an entire infrastructure back to a targeted threat actor. So this concludes most of the actual things that we saw in 2019 on the threat report. Now let's look into the key recommendation. I don't think anyone can emphasize this enough. It is important to make sure that your system patching is up to date to better protect your environment. But again, this is easier said than done. I mean, if I ask you something, if it is really that easy to patch, then isn't it true then that most people would be doing this and things then should be fine. Now, although it is important to patch, there are other kinds of things that you should be doing to help at least determine if you need to patch. Like if there is vulnerability, make sure if that could affect you. And or you need to look at the overall risk of that particular vulnerability. The reason why we say that is there may not be a lot of reasons in different businesses on why that is always that easy or immediate feasible to patch physically on the box. And that is why if you look at one of the key recommendations, it is visibility. Now, for internal visibility, we normally talk on what is your business critical infrastructure. And you also then need to look at what is your business processes that your asset depends on. Now, most medium to large businesses cannot monitor and protect everything. That is why it's important to understand what is your business risk. What is needed to buy down these risks? First, focus on what is the most important to your business. Then start to look at your cyber assets. You need to understand what is the applications you need to protect, what is the data results on them, and what are the services and processes. Have a look at the configuration. What does it look like? Have a look at the vulnerabilities. So just see what might exist on those applications. And then you need to understand what you need to protect. How are those critical applications communicating with each other? Next is looking at the network infrastructure. Do you have a baseline on the performance levels? This is so that you can have visibility if something's out of the norm in your environment. The reason why creating network segmentation is important it is to limit the amount of blind spotting that you might have. And it should then give you more visibility in how these applications are communicating to and between each other. Then we can start to move to the external visibility. So here you would need to have the threat information and be able to share that threat data. I like what Baltic in 2016 when it comes to AI and ML that AI is the science and machine learning is the algorithm that makes the machine smarter. Now, artificial intelligence does help. And fortunately, that's been using that for the last seven years. And this has been able to help us with the volume of data coming through in our labs. It's helping us to create valid signatures for our customers. And you get all of these things. You have your internal visibility, you have your external visibility, and now you have awareness, and now you can act upon it. The first step is awareness and how you can act upon it. So you want to have a look at your cybersecurity tools. Make sure that they have open APIs and that they are vendor neutral. You want to make sure that the vendor that you have can also integrate and share intel and also connect with other vendors. You want to make sure that they can automate some of this decision making. You want to make sure that you have an, uh, a mitigation library that you can orchestrate some of this actual patching and remediation and identification. You also want the information to be digestible. You want that information to be visual so that it is easier to pinpoint at the information you need to further look into it. 
All of these things are part of the foundation on why Fortinet has been building our Fortinet security fabric. And I want to end this off with the Fortinet security fabric. And again, the fabric has a solution available for all parts of your network. This has been designed to work together as a simple, integrated security fabric with a single management interface. And one important aspect of this is that it has been designed to protect your network by sharing threat intelligence in real time. This concludes the presentation and I will be handing over back to Cameron to help with any Q&As that you guys might have. We might also be posting some of your questions on social media, so please follow Fortinet and myself for more feedback on your, uh, on your questions. Thank you.